I'm Father Robert Lawton, president of Loyola Marymount University, a university proud and fortunate to be in Los Angeles. I've been lucky enough to live much of my life in great world cities. I grew up on the East Coast, lived in Washington, New York, Boston. Then I moved to Europe, lived in Munich and Berlin, Florence and Rome. All these are great world cities, but they're old as great world cities. And I used to think sometimes when I was in them, what would it have been like to live in one of these cities when it was in its youth as a great world city? Well, now I get that chance. Los Angeles is a great world city, arguably the great world city, and yet it's in its youth, or maybe in its adolescence, full of optimism and energy and hope and great spirit. And so in studying this great and wonderful city, we're studying not only the city itself, but the modern world, because that's what great cities do. They live very intensely, the modern world. And in a city like Los Angeles, uh, it also lives the future as well. The future feels closer in Los Angeles than anywhere else. So this urban lecture series studies a city, but it studies our world, it studies our future. I hope that you enjoy today's lecture. Um, certainly cities are at the whim of state and national governments. I don't think there's a single city that's been able to uh, um, autonomously protect itself from what's been going on globally or nationally in terms of the economic downturn. I, and I may be wrong, but I don't think I, I, I know of a, a single city that's uh, escaped because of its own policies, that it's so I isolated, not tied to the world economy, that it also hasn't suffered. And certainly the city of Los Angeles has suffered. Within that context, what can a city like Los Angeles or a region like Los Angeles County do to try to uh, mitigate this downturn to a certain degree? And how, what else does the, uh, a city do to be able to help the national, the state, the, or let me rephrase it, what, can, what action can a city take to help the local, regional, state, and national, and even world economy um, recover? What, what, what can we do? Or do we just parochially focus on, uh, on certain uh, issues? Um, we have a couple of guests with us. Um, the, uh, let me introduce four. them. Yeah, four, <laughs> a couple times two, yes. Um, let me first introduce uh, the individual that is uh, right next to me, and, and that is uh, Steve Soboroff. Uh, he has uh, uh, been known as a longtime business leader, a civic leader. Uh, he was a candidate for mayor in 2001, and he was actually, if we had had a partisan type of uh, elections, he was a top Republican vote getter in the primary and probably would have been in the, in, in the runoff. But because we believe in nonpartisan elections in, in California, you're out of luck, Steve. You, you had to... Uh, I bring up this Republican thing. It's not very popular. I, I sort of like... Are you a Republican? I'm a very moderate Republican and a very moderate Democrat. So, so, knows me. so are you a registered Republican? It's I public record. I could go look it up. Okay, then I am. Okay. How do you, I don't know how you change. What do you do? Uh, you just change your I like register. The president. What do I I will get you a registration form and we will mail it to you and we'll fill it out for you and then all you have to do is sign it and we'll take care of that. So, but what is really what uh, um, Steve Soboroff is best known for around here is he is the chair of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles Advisory Board. Um, of all his accomplishments, that is what he is most proud of. Um, <laughs> in addition, he is also chair. <laughs> Carol? I, I mean, of course. Yes, thank you. <laughs> He, he is also the chairman and CEO of Playa Vista, one of the nation's most significant multi-use real estate projects. And his team has overseen a, an incredible uh, um, development. It borders, I think we share over one mile border with Loyola Marymount University and, and Playa Vista. And so we're gonna ask him about- you creates 34.6% of the ambient noise level after dark at Playa Vista. <laughs> and, None and, of you are guilty. And we're striving for 40%, so don't we... we, we Friday <laughs> nights, it's about 70%. Yeah. So, so this is uh, Steve Soboroff uh, already complaining about the noise. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, Kerry Rogers, who is the uh, Vice President of Business Assistance and Development for the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. 
Uh, she joined this corporation back in May of 07 and has had over 25 years of marketing experience in both the public and private sectors and more than 13 years in management and administrative uh, of municipal government operations. Uh, prior to joining the LAEDC, which is what we always refer to it as the LAEDC, she served as manager of marketing and economic development for the city of Santa Clarita. And if uh, I've included a bio for all of you to have, because we can go on and on about her, um, her, her background and her accomplishments. Uh, next to her is uh, Javier Gutierrez, who uh, is Senior Vice President for Capital Markets for a real estate group called, or excuse me, a private equity group called Phoenix Realty Group. He joined this group as Vice President back in June of 03 and now serves as the company's primary conduit to uh, institutional investors and capital markets. And we'll ask him what all of that is about. Also, his proudest moment, besides uh, graduating from Harvard and Stanford, is that he's been asked to be a regent here at Loyola Marymount University. Also, his proudest moment probably happened last year when he became a father for the first time, as far as he knows. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Fernando. <Yeah. laughs> and finally, and certainly not last or least, one of my uh, favorite civic leaders is Carol Schatz. She is President and Chief Executive of the Central City Association of Los Angeles. Uh, she is the first woman to serve in this position. She also serves as President and CEO of the Downtown Center Business Improvement District, and it's, which is a coalition of over 450 property owners in the core of downtown Los Angeles. Um, under uh, Carol's direction, the CCA, which is the acronym for the Central Cities Association, and we'll continue to refer to it as the CCA throughout the panel, uh, is the, uh, under her direction, is the business advocacy leader on city and county issues. She was recently named by Los Angeles Magazine in their 100 Most Powerful People in Los Angeles. And she, of course, is uh, one of the most important advocates for economic growth and for downtown and, and under her uh, direction, CCA has done a wonderful job of helping really the development of downtown. Again, I've provided a uh, biography for you guys so because we can go on and on and talk about all the different projects that Carol has, some say single-handedly, undertaken to improve this city. Um, we are in an economic downturn, okay? And so let me just turn to you first, Steve, and ask you, how's it going? How many houses are you selling down in Playa Vista? Have you cut your prices? What are you going to do? Yeah, LMU students get 85% uh, off. <laughs> There's our new deal. Yeah, as um, long as you pay with that lion do dollars. That, this, uh, part of you guys are in the uh, LA politics, and I think that one thing that would be important, I know the mayor watches this on Channel 36. Um, everyone, can you, does that camera pan, or does it just... Everyone stand up. You don't have to show your faces to the mayor. He wants to be a, a, a director. No, he wants to be a. Everybody stand, stand up. <laughs> now, what I want you to do and is, if <laughs> you want the mayor to run for governor, I want you to stay standing. Or if you want him to stay as mayor, if you wait, if you want him to stay as mayor, stay standing. Okay. If you want him to run for governor, please sit down. You know, the mayor is considering, the mayor of Los Angeles, did you say L.A. politics? Uh, okay. No, but the, the mayor of Los Angeles well, is Steve, contemplating. They're used to having an articulate professor in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> so try it one more time. The mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Villaragosa, is considering running for governor of the state of California. Now, if you would like to see the mayor stay another term, and become stay mayor because he just got elected for mayor for four more years. Then I would like you to sit down. Sit down. Okay. And, and if, if you would like the mayor to run to for run governor, for governor, stand up. Stand up. Oh. Now, if that isn't a message of all time, pan it, show it. That, thanks, Steve. Now he's going to stop watching the show. <laughs> yeah, okay. You uniformly said, I, I'm surprised that it was unanimous. I thought there'd be one or two people standing. Um, and that's of interest to me. Now, to if, uh, of course, we've had uh, the mayor come here several times. And next time he comes, he's going to say, if you want to live in Playa Vista, please sit down. Or he's going to do that. <laughs> no, I think we need the mayor. I, I think we need him. I think for the first time, we've got, um, we've got somebody um, who can relate to what's going on in Washington now. You've got 
uh, um, uh, um, a rising star and all that kind of stuff, and I hope he stays sticks. I've told well, him. I hope he sticks you, around. Since you uh, brought the subject up, uh, we obviously throw a subject for him. Yeah, we we've had this discussion before, but let me g give this line of our, uh, uh, of reasoning. Every mayor of Los Angeles has to be considered a candidate for governor of California. That helps the city leverage more out of the state. It helps him be a player in Sacramento. It helps so that he can bargain and negotiate, especially if people think that he may end up up there. Just like every governor of California should always be considered as a candidate for president, unless it's Schwarzenegger and they're not eligible because of citizenship, but that gives California a little bit of sway. And, and so that it's almost a responsibility of a mayor of LA or a governor of California to play in the national scene or at the state scene and be active and therefore be considered a candidate. Did he just change anybody's mind? If it is, uh, raise your hand. No, no, was that, uh, okay. is that a legitimate? No, it's uh, a legitimate concern. I just think that the balance is out of whack. I think he can do so much more for LA mm -hmm. to stay the mayor in his relationships in Sacramento, in his relationships with Washington, than he could do from Sacramento or wherever. But anyway, okay, so what was your question about condos? No, I think your question, my question was, are you, are, are you a Republican? <laughs> Um, so, no, Playa Vista, look, well, first how, how's Playa Vista doing? And what do you do? I mean, clearly there's been a global downturn, economic downturn, real estate. How is that specifically impacting Playa Vista? Where do you see us going? What is your strategy in terms of dealing with all the issues that uh, we are facing in Los Angeles and globally? Okay, I don't consider Playa Vista a real estate project, so it's hard to, to relate it to other real estate because I consider it a project in public policy. Okay, explain and, that. Okay, uh, because our goals at Playa Vista are to make traffic work, to help the environment, to create a great park system, to help public education, to create jobs, and to create housing. Those are public policy. My, my issues are very similar to a mayor's issues or a, or a governor's issues or a president's issues. The end result of that is this community. Because we hold those um, goals as our goals, um, Playa has done very, very well in the economic downturn. Our, 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 our largest unit has, de has decreased in value by 8 or 10 percent, when my, my personal home's probably gone down 30 or 40 percent. And I believe it's because, um, because people love living there, because there's value and because there's great public policy around it. Saying that, I would say that, that, I mean, having been in public life as a parks commissioner and running for office and, you know, get my butt kicked in 2001, only by 2%, though, so it's close. Um, I would say that um, helping economic development in a democracy is much tougher than in a benevolent dictatorship. If I want 24 parks, we build 24 parks. And the, as I was a, when I was, I was a parks commissioner in L.A., we built two parks in one year. I almost died doing the Staples Center transaction, one transaction. Um, the, our system of government in Los Angeles, there is so much spread out power that nobody has power. And that makes doing things and getting things done a whole lot tougher. One statistic. My son was an um, advanced man for the mayor of New York, Mike Bloomberg. And so he took me to City Hall. New York is a much bigger city than Los Angeles. It's a much, big, much bigger budget. The, uh, the mayor has a lot more control. So I went into City Hall and I said, well, I don't get this, because it was a tenth the size of our City Hall, physically, because there's power there. There are 52 council members in New York. You know where they are? They're across the street. The mayor probably doesn't know him by name. He probably doesn't invite him over. Nothing. The power is in is in this one in this one area. So when you have forms of government like city manager forms of government, look what Bud Overham did in the city of Burbank when he was there. Look what um, Daly and look what Bloomberg can do. Um, here, the city hall is huge because you got 15 people that run everything, and then each one of those has 200 neighborhood councils that are running everything. The power is so spread, it's so much harder to implement great public policy. So at Playa, for me, an opportunity to implement 10% of our workforce are felons. Um, we have 10% um, uh, of the, proper, uh, the condos are sold half price 
to cops, firemen, teachers, and nurses. We're able to implement these great public, gives me the chills to talk about it, but it would give me the, it, we implement these great public policy <coughs> things in a, uh, um, because it's easy to implement, and LA is so difficult. So you, I mean, we've talked about this consistently about a city f uh, manager, former government, or centralization versus decentralization or fragmentation. A dictatorship, what do you want? You know, as long as it's benevolent and as long as it's me. Yeah. So, <laughs> Carrie, you have a master's in public administration and you've worked for many cities. Uh, Santa Clarita we mentioned, but also I think Palmdale and, and a couple of others. How, are, are those cities doing any better or worse in this time period than the city of Los Angeles? Um, I, I think all cities are really suffering. And the reason is, is that um, this recession is very different than other recessions and it's really consumer driven. So when we all hold on to our pocketbooks, you guys aren't shopping, or you know, your parents aren't shopping, we're not buying cars, houses, um, that all affects sales tax and property tax that come back, comes back to the cities. And what that means is those things that we all expect, like our parks to be in great condition, our streets to be clean, um, all those public service things are funded through property tax and sales tax revenue. So the cities are hurting, and I think you're going to see a number of them have filed for bankruptcy. You will see it continue. Um, it's scary times. Uh, I have a Wait lot a of cities are filing for bankruptcy. Right. And so, how does a city go out of business? I mean, what happens? You know, they they have an opportunity to uh, uh, restructure. Um, they need to look at their debt. Um, you have employees that are being laid off. You see it every day in the newspapers. It isn't just with cities. We see also with high school districts and others that are affected. I mean, every day you open the newspaper and you see public employees that you would think typically would not be at risk of losing a job. Uh, but there isn't the money coming in through a city through a general fund in order to be able to keep these employees on board. So some of them are offering things such as early retirement. Um, or just going back through and realizing they're going to have to have a cut across the board. Uh, and we'll see more of it is, is, is our guess at the LAEDC. That's what we're predicting. So um, what is the LAEDC? What, what does it do? What is its mission? What's its purpose? Uh, the Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, uh, our mission is very simple. It's business attraction, retention, and expansion, and job growth in the regions of LA County. So we represent 88 cities over 100 unincorporated areas in the county. We work with businesses, we work with the jurisdictions, uh, and our goal is to help businesses be successful when they are. Um, they hire people, you know, it's, uh, they grow, they continue to prosper, they hire more people, um, and that's, that's what we do. We have people. So you must have a real easy job compared to the same thing in Detroit or anywhere. Everybody wants to come to LA. It's sunny, it's nice, you, got, you can live in Playa Vista. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to come to LA? You want a well, list? Not true. No. I want a list. It, is, it is the sunshine factor. We do have that going for us. But, um, is your I, job easier than it is in De for Detroit? No, it, it is. Come on, it's got to be easier than Detroit. Well, I will tell you that, uh, I don't know if you can see them, but the vultures are out there. They are circling overhead. And That's just the administration from LMU. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're there to pick off our businesses because LA County has, you know, we have 400,000 businesses. They're very successful. And as you know, I mean, California and LA County, we are known for being very innovative. We're the innovative capital of the entire you know country. What, uh, what's interesting to me is you represent the whole region, the county, but you know, I can say as a resident of the city of LA, hey, El Segundo and Burbank and Santa Clarita, that, they're doing the same thing. They're picking off the people from, some, from the city of LA. And so sometimes the vultures are eating themselves and we eat the region. How, how do we prevent that from happening? You know, I think there, uh, when a business needs to expand, if they're, um, which is a common problem, mm -hmm. uh, if they're in a multitude of, of buildings, they need to be under one roof for efficiency and to be effective. Uh, they typically look at one place that has a new building, and, and we don't see them in a lot of um, uh, built-out cities. So oftentimes we will see companies that might be in the city of LA or in other areas that they have locations all over that need to be under one roof, and they tend to go to places where there's either one building, mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are new, and they would go to the areas that have newer buildings with some land for development. You know, which might be in the North LA County area or some other pockets. You know what it takes to get a building permit in the city of Los Angeles? 
No, I... An act of God. Yes. I was at a meeting in... Um, no, why, was why is that? Ago. Why? And a guy from... Uh, uh, there were mayors sitting up on the podium. And a guy got up, and he was with a Coca-Cola company. And they were building a bottling, a bottling plant. He said, I have tried so hard, and I'm back and forth with this department and that neighbor. It's driving me crazy. I can't. So the mayor of Tucson pulls out of his pocket a building permit, and he signs it. And he says, here, you bring those plans to Tucson. Here's your building permit. You start construction next Thursday. And you know what? They did. Our process that, that to sounds get like an our, urban t uh, tale. I mean, I, it's I like not. It. You want to see it? I'll show it yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. It's there. I mean, getting it, a building okay. permit is. You know, Carol will talk about. <laughs> but, uh, Carrie, where does your funding to run this comp uh, this organization come from? We actually are paid through by the uh, county board of supervisors each year. So it provides the. We're kind of prepaid. Uh, our services are no cost to businesses. Um, and our company, LAEDC, also is membership-based, but my funding for my department comes from uh, LA County and some grants. So if I wanted to start a new university, because I've figured this out after talking to alumni that they've been around, for, you know, after they've graduated 10 years and I ask them about political science, they only remember one or two things. And I ask them about the Spanish class, they say, hola Paco, como estas? <laughs> and uh, I ask them about economics, they say supply and demand. So I'm just going to hire about six or seven faculty members, and we're just going to teach that. And I wanted to start a new university. Uh, I'm going to call it the five-minute university. <laughs> and I needed some space. How, how, would, how would it work? I'd go to you, and I'd say, hey, I have this idea. I, um, what do you do? Kind of like a real estate agent, get me an office, or get me loans, or what do you do specifically? We do. We coordinate everything. So if you're looking for space, we'll go. We have a, a database that we search for space that's available. And we'll provide you information on that. Um, if you're looking for financing, we'll put you in touch with financing um, institutions. Uh, if you're looking for employees, we'll work with um, uh, the work source centers to find you the right employees. Uh, if you're looking for training dollars, we've got all kinds of sources of funds for training dollars for employees. I'm going to kind of hold your hand through the permitting process. That's what we do. It sounds like Steve does. What's the difference between the mayor's business team and you guys? We just work collectively. Because that, that's just the city of L.A. where right. you guys are doing right. the county. Oh, so we cover okay. the city plus L.A. County, but we work collectively together. Okay. Hey, um, I'm going to talk to Javier Gutierrez. I've been reading your bio and trying to understand. What do you do? <laughs> what do I do? That's yeah, a good what, question. What do you um, do? We are a real estate investment manager, and what that means is we create funds uh, where we manage money on behalf of large institutional investors like public pension funds and insurance companies. And specifically our strategy, and I want to get back to a comment that, that Steve made, our strategy is to focus a lot of this institutional capital into urban areas. Basically saying, in America, if you believe in the property markets, you have to believe in the urban areas. Because the reality is, that's where people want to live, that's where people want to work, that's where they want to have their families. I mean, the, the students in this classroom right now, in this auditorium right now, you guys are going to reshape the United States in ways that people are only beginning to, uh, to try to write about because the millennials, the Generation Y, the Echo Boomers, whatever you want to call, those born between 1980 and 2006, roughly, you guys are going to be, in terms of sheer numbers, you're going to outnumber the baby boomer generation. I mean, numbers, they, they vary from 78 million to 96 million. And the reality is your demographic is an urban demographic. The comment I wanted to make about what Steve said is, it's not surprising that your units have only gone down 10%, in my opinion, given our strategy. The Case-Shiller Index has said that California home values in 2008 fell by 28%. You guys only fell by less than 10 and the reason is you have everything there. We're urban. You're we're urban, urban, and you have, you know, where people can work. You have parks. People can, you know, ride their bikes. They don't have to take, you know, long commutes from Number Lancaster and Number one thing is that Palmdale. they're next to Loyola Marymount University, and that's where everybody Well, that, to be. there's that, too, which is actually a very key point, which is, you know, you have a community that is self-contained with education institutions, and ultimately that's what we've presented to institutional investors, saying... So, but wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Mm-hmm. You don't have any money. 
But what you do is you go to all the people and institutions that have money, mm -hmm. insurance companies, pension funds. So everybody that has a lot of money, you go to them and you say, give me your money and I will invest it for you. Yes. In okay. short, that's what we do. And so how do you get paid? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> that's why I'm asking. No, I think, uh, well, Art the, Madoff the, said the same thing. Well, exactly. <laughs> no, the basic structure, and this is, you know, this is a very um, large in industry that we're talking about. In 2007, I think there was $86 billion that were uh, funded into real estate private equity funds uh, in 2008. I think it was closer to 68. In 2009, it's going to fall off the map because pension funds in particular are having difficulty funding uh, these opportunity funds like ours, we get paid very simply by managing the money, so there's a fee to manage the money, but also we participate along with our investors and participate in the upside. So the typical fund structure. The upside meaning the profits. The profits. So when we invest, so for example, we currently had two funds, one that has money, one that we've spent all the money just targeting the greater LA area. And the focus was to say, hey, your the unnamed public pension fund, you want to create residential opportunities in the greater LA area for the middle income, for students graduating, whether it be rental housing or for sale housing. And the reality is you're a very large institution. You don't really have any real estate expertise. You can you know, invest in our platform. We can find those deals. We backed the first for sale housing development in Lincoln Heights in 45 years. It was a off the chart success and the reason again going back to my point and going back to why Playa Vista in our mind is a example of urban development going forward is it's because people are there they just don't have the housing opportunities that are clean and safe and close to transit this development we did in particular was right next to the Avenue 26 goal line stop mm. uh, so when we talk on a talk by the way of what government should do and I wrote down what you said of enabling private sector to create opportunities you know the infrastructure investments that governments can do are just incredible uh, accelerators to development for housing, for retail, for what have you, that will then, you know, be successful because that's where people are going to want to live. They're going to want to be close to transit. Our, that development in particular was 165 for sale condos, all affordable to the middle income, the medium household income in Los Angeles. And the fact that we sold it out in less than six months really showed to wait, the wait, fact. You didn't, you didn't build it, though. We were the investor. In, okay, in the, so there was a builder who It wasn't was your partner. money, and you didn't build it. Okay, so what do you do? <laughs> well, you know, we had to underwrite the risk and work with the developer. We're, we're slightly different in that we actually can build as a, as a company. Oh, but you didn't. I mean, you and didn't. that one we did not. But what do we do? You know, it's very similar to what professors do. You know, they take someone else's knowledge, they <laughs> come up with something new, and they disseminate it. You're brilliant. And that's exactly what we've done. You're brilliant. <laughs> you are brilliant. Okay, well, enough about you. Let's go to Carol. <laughs> Carol. Yes. Downtown has been booming. It's great. It's a fantastic yes. place. State yes. Center, uh, all kinds of new buildings. It's, uh, it's just wonderful. I, I, you don't recognize it. People that I know who hadn't been to downtown in 10 years and they go there. Uh, I remember driving through downtown uh, during weekends. You could not see a person now. It's uh, vibrant, all kinds of new restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, is it all going to stop because of this recession? Recession isn't helping anything. But even in, let's, let's take an, uh, an actual case. Um, one of our developers came to market with about 73 condominiums in the historic center of downtown about uh, a month and a half ago. And they went, to, uh, they went to auction with those units instead of trying to sell them one at a time because the market is so depressed. They sold 65 of the 73 units. The bad news is that the developer um, certainly was unable to reap the uh, profit that he had, and it was a he, had penciled in when he was creating the deal to begin with. So the bad news about that is he has less money to invest in the next project and to meet his costs on this one. The good news was that the markets, the, the units were offered at a much more affordable price 
than they would have in a hot real estate market. And so all of them sold in this one weekend. So the good news for downtown was that we now have 63 units of housing that are going to be filled with people who will be walking their dogs, who will be uh, eating in our restaurants, who will be buying books, uh, going to Macy's. And so although the, this recession is impacting every real estate market everywhere in the country, we feel that the, the boom continues in a way downtown, or the momentum continues down. There's no boom anywhere, but the momentum continues downtown because we are peopling those units, and there are many more coming to market, uh, even though the, the, you know, at, at a lower price than anybody could have anticipated even a year ago. In your bio, it talks about you initiating or really helping with the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance. What is that? Um, this was a very brilliant thing on my part, if I don't say so <laughs> myself, uh, which I stole. A lot of brilliant people up here. Yeah, absolutely. Which I stole from my colleagues in New York. Interestingly enough, downtown New York, where um, the World Trade Center was, um, they considered themselves a nine to five downtown. What they meant by that was that people took the subway to work, they lived somewhere else, either in another part of Manhattan or in one of the other boroughs or beyond, and then they worked and then they left at five which is certainly the, the, the way downtown Los Angeles was for so very many years. You just didn't go there unless you worked there. And um, they decided that they were going to try to encourage the reuse of older buildings, not necessarily historic buildings, but older buildings that were empty, office buildings. And the best use they felt was to convert these buildings to housing. Because as I've said in my, you know, said just a little bit earlier, when you put people in, in, in housing, you in immediately enliven and rejuvenate a neighborhood. You can't just do that with office workers who are coming in and then leaving and, you know, not spending any money anywhere. So, I stole that concept. It's called adaptive reuse. It's, it, it's taking an, uh, a building that was made for one use, office, and converting it to another use, residential. We did that with this building. We took it from an office building to an educational use building. Right. And that, by the way, was how we began this boom in downtown, because Staples Center, which Mr. Soboroff, many people do not know, was really responsible for, and I always like to give him credit whenever we're together. He brought those developers to downtown and they kind of came kicking and screaming. They didn't think that this would be a good place to put an arena. The arena opened in 1999. We got the adaptive reuse ordinance passed in 1999, Fernando, and that synergy of having a place to come for Angelinos, and then beginning the development of housing units was, I think, what really made the difference. Because just sports and entertainment alone could not have created this boom. Um, we have, uh, there's been about $18 billion of investment in downtown Los Angeles since 1999. And a huge portion of that is the investment in these new housing projects. We've created, since 1999, 13,000 new housing units. So in 1999, we had about 13,000 units. This is the second largest city in the country. We had 13,000 units, maybe 18,000 people living within the freeway ring around downtown. We now have close to 40,000 people. And think about it, we're the second largest city in the country, 
and we can't accommodate a half a million, uh, a few million, because we are the center of the entire region in terms of transportation and in terms of jobs. And that's why downtown living and urban living like in Playa Vista is quintessential smart growth. And that's why it's so important beyond the revenue that it spawns, the tax dollars to the city, it is critical to um, developing a, a region and a county and a city that works. So what does, how is the CCA, Central City Association, different than a Chamber of Commerce? And then where do you get your funding from? Um, our funding is entirely private sector. Um, we have businesses and property owners that pay us membership dues. And with that money, we advocate for business and develop policies that benefit not just people downtown. Mr. Soboroff has been a longstanding member, which I greatly appreciate. I pay my this dues. This guy has sure. too. Huh? My dues paid up? Yeah, you're all paid up. And um, uh, we, uh, and we advocate for business, which is not an easy thing to do in this city at this time. The chamber, we work very closely with on many issues. The chamber has a broader focus. Um, we stay focused on the city of LA and downtown. Of course, we work with the Board of Supervisors and we have some legislative initiatives in Sacramento and in Washington, but we keep a local focus. And we also have an expertise and a focus on real estate and land use because one of the things you said, you, you, you identified three things that the city, cities and municipi municipalities get involved with. One thing I would add is the thing that makes working in a city and doing the kind of work I do, the kind of work that, that um, Javier does and, and Steve does, is this is where things come up out of the ground. Uh, if you're a congressman, you don't, you're not directly responsible for what we call the built environment, for the building of this building, for the building of where you, wherever you're living, for the high rises that, that, that are offices. And that, th this land use function um, is really one of the most critical powers that a city has and it is very exciting to me having worked in the savings and loan industry and focusing on state and federal government. I used to look down my nose at local government. And now I think it's the most important level of government because this is where you actually see the product of policy. And you don't necessarily see the product of policy or it takes much longer to see it in Washington and Sacramento. So let me start with you, Carol, and go down this way. Sure. What would be like the adaptive reuse ordinance? What two specific things would you recommend that government or city of LA do? If you were writing a memo, uh, like a three to five page memo to uh, uh, the civic leaders, and it was about economic development, what would you include in that? What would you be your two recommendations that you would include in that, in that memo? Get out of the way and stop being an obstacle. Okay, is that one or two? That's one. Okay, <laughs> get out of the way. And uh, Carrie and I just left a meeting in the mayor's office in which we were, uh, they were asking for our opinions, the mayor, the mayor uh, called this meeting, uh, about what we could do to tr try to retain and attract business. And I think we, I think the, the number one message I think we all sent was, the mayor needs to focus on getting the word out to the business community in Los Angeles. And when I say the business community, the way I like to define us is this way. We are the part of the community that creates jobs and housing. That is what we do. You cannot function as a society. There is nothing without business. Yeah, but uh, why is government's not against that? They want government, housing. Government, unfortunately, um, has 
a variety, especially in this city, has a variety of social goals that it wants to meet. Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. But you can't, you have to be, you have to be balanced in, in the terms of the policies that you develop so that when you're trying to provide affordable housing, you're not doing it in a way, for example, that makes it more difficult for developers to build it. You have to incentivize them okay, to do so it. So one, we have to. Get, so the second thing is getting a message out to business that the city cares about retaining you, and wants to help you with whatever your specific needs are now, especially in a downturn. Even if the message is not true, just say it. We talked today about how some simple things to do to make it truer. So. N number one, get out of the way. Get out okay, of the way. Elaborate. How are they in the way? Okay. Let me give you three examples that we're, that we're actually fighting right now. Number one, we have a sign ordinance that is being proposed. It was so sweeping and overbroad that it would have prohibited Nordstrom's from having the same size sign in the city of Los Angeles than it could have in Burbank or Glendale or Minnesota or New York. So if Nordstrom is looking at that and they have the opportunity to go to Burbank on the, on the border of Los Angeles or El Segundo, where are they going to go? Investment, money, can go wherever it wants, and it goes where it's easiest. So that's just one example of the sign ordinance. Yeah, but, you know, some of these signs are pretty big. I mean, so I, some of these signs are, are bad, and we've got to deal with billboards and super graphics, but you don't do something that's so overbroad that makes very important investment dollars want to go somewhere else. Two. We have, um, we just heard that the, we, we didn't hear it, we've been dealing with it for a while. The Community Redevelopment Agency uh, is uh, putting forth a uh, policy that will be far more onerous than the city's newest green building policy, making it, setting standards for developers in redevelopment areas, which are always areas where there's great blight. So you want to encourage In other words, investment. the poor areas, the, uh, well, the, the ugly areas. Is well, the downtown was, you know, you can call it a poor area. It was, it was certainly undervalued, and it was, uh, it was hurting economically. Um, is this the time to impose more stringent standards than the city itself is imposing at a time when nobody is developing at all anyway? So, no. wait, wait, but the standard would say that the building has to be green, environmentally safe, well, and good. What's wrong nobody's with that? Wrong, no, nothing's wrong with being green, but they set, they, they've set a standard of LEED certified, which is far more expensive than just intent, you know, meeting the intent. The city doesn't green. have a dimmer switch. You know what a dimmer switch is? <laughs> it's either, the city switch is either off or on. Right. A dimmer switch is, middle. if you don't, if it's either... The sign, they let things go to where the signs are out of control, then they shut everything down. There's a medium point, there's a middle point, there's gravity, there's other things that take uh, into consideration. And so there's this tendency that it's everything's, just ignore it, and then when it becomes a crisis, all the politicians get up because they go on cameras, like if they didn't have cameras in City Hall, Cameras at the LA County things with, or LAUSD. So what, what are your what are your two recommendations in this uh, policy paper that would that government should do? She, she did her two. Who's in this? Is, oh, you want me to go? Happy. Okay, I oh, actually. So you're, you're well, say, but go no, go ahead. No, okay, I, I have a good example because we have a unique perspective that we're headquartered in New York and we have an office here in Los Angeles. And in late 2007, we raised two funds one for each of those metro areas, about half a billion in total. One thing that was very interesting is when we went out and pitched institutional investors on the benefits of investing in Los Angeles well, explain, When you say institutional in New York, investors to the students, you mean the Public pension company, funds, insurance People with company, money. People with money, large institutions that but this not is. Individual. Not, individuals, no, 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 not individuals. Not individuals. Not individuals, large institutions. One thing that was very interesting is when we said New York, they all got that the government infrastructure in New York 
was actually going to be a, a benef was going to be beneficial towards executing our strategy. No one said that about Los Angeles. They said LA is great because look at the demographics. It's a growth market. We want to be there. No one even remotely mentioned, yeah, you know, there's government. government that government will be there. But New York, they lit, I mean, people understood there were programs, there were okay, so what there was New, incentives. What, what does New York do that LA, what can we draw as an example from New York? Well, I think, what? you know, a perfect example was they, they came up. The private sector didn't come up with the adaptive reuse. You know, the private sector in Los Angeles said, that's a great idea. In New York, the government entity said, what are we going to do with all these buildings? Let's do something with these buildings. They're the ones that are driving you know, initiatives that are coming up with the ideas. I mean, part of this is also, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's fatigue on businesses' side to say, we need this. Will you let us do it as opposed right. to being welcoming to Mayor do it? Mayor Viragosa is watching. Yes. What should he do? Well, I think the first thing you have to do is, is what, you, what Carol said, was just to say, w listen to us and seem, you know, open to ideas that you can put forward that aren't just, you know, it's either this way or that way. Yeah, but uh, so I'm not, wait, saying, but wait, I'm not me, saying this is true, but let's say it wasn't business that elected Antonio Villaraigosa. It was labor and the community, and mm -hmm. he wants to listen to them first. Yeah, but I think that's, you know, you want to have impact that's long-ranging, not just short-term, self-serving to the constituents. I mean, we're constituents, too. You know, look at what I, our firm, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we're bringing institutional capital into areas that haven't had it for years. We're targeting the South of Los Angeles and the East LA's in areas in which, you know, the, the government sector is woefully underfunded. It's not going to come up with housing on its own. We're going to want to be a partner, but let me be a partner. Come to me and say, let me be your partner. And union, mem and union members who are not working for the government are working, hello, for a business. Carrie, what two recommendations would you make that uh, in this memo to either the city of LA or the city of Palmdale, Santa Clarita, any city that's facing this, what should government do right now? Uh, we come from a very business friendly um, aspect. Uh, meaning that uh, it's important for government to make it as easy for a business to do business within their city, whether that's going through a permitting process and streamlining everything to just making it as simple as possible to get from point A to point B where you have an idea to where you're opening business and you're actually creating jobs. Uh, so one is to continue to be business friendly. Okay, but um, what does that mean? I mean, who, who's not business friendly? I mean, I'm like business friendly. City of friendly. Los Angeles. Okay, but what is that? I, I'm talking. Wait, he hasn't. Give me my chance for my tuba. Go ahead. <laughs> we actually created. We actually created something uh, called the uh, most business friendly city in LA County Award uh, three which years is which ago, one? and 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 the reason for that is because L, the city of LA and LA County cities get trashed all around the world. Uh, we go to conferences worldwide, and everybody talks about how fabulous all these other places are, and they say, you know what, if you want to go pick off a business, you go to L the city of L.A. or L.A. County cities because they are the most unbusiness friendly cities in the entire world. Because we do everything we can to uh, put up barriers to business. Uh, so what we've done is we've created now, is actually... This some, they put up barriers to business. Is this like on purpose, incompetence? I mean, what, why would a city put up barriers to business? What, you know, what, what's the, the I, generic reason for this? I think there is, in city government, I think there is an innate bureaucracy. There, it, it, if it's a small city, medium or large, there is just a certain level of bureaucracy. And what that means is that certain departments don't talk to other departments. They, there is not a communication. When, when you go to build a building, you need to have planning and building and safety and engineering and public works, all these different fire department, public safety, everybody has to be involved or your building is not going to get built. Your plans will not be approved. And if you can't get all the different departments together to sit around a table to be able to talk and do things at the same time and agree on what's going to happen, you will not have your building built. Something will be stuck. Yes, but I, I just want to follow up on that and say, here's the best example I can give. We were with Bud Overham, who's the deputy mayor for economic development, who was the city manager of Burbank for 18 years. I'm a baby boomer. So what happened in Burbank? He got fired or how come no. he came to L.A.? So he retired and then went to head up our community redevelopment agency, is now is working for the mayor. Terrific guy. 
The city of Burbank, when I was growing up, because we had friends there, was a bedroom community of, resi of residences. It had a tiny, little teeny tiny city hall. It had its own police department and its own fire department. It had no big buildings. It had no, it, it, it was, it served people, lived there and worked other places, worked in Los Angeles. We, the city of LA, because it is so difficult to bring investment to Los Angeles because it's so difficult to, um, to, for that business to, to take that money and actually create their business in LA, have created the city of Burbank by our policies. Think about, uh, think about that shopping center, what's it called in, in Burbank? It took, those, those stores could have gone in, into the city of Los Angeles but the city of Los Angeles was not interested in retail jobs. Why? Because retail jobs do not pay a living wage. And most of them are not union jobs. So the unions fought the, you know, you know, locating retail businesses in Los Angeles. So what does that mean? Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, El Segundo, all get all that sales tax revenue and the city of LA loses. Just, you know, a couple of examples. Yeah, Carrie, I, what? I think the other thing, uh, what we're doing is, in creating this award, we're actually recognizing those cities within LA County that are actually are doing things that are business friendly. El Segundo, the city of Lancaster, city of Santa Clarita, city of Vernon. Um, and, and what but they're nobody doing... Nobody lives in Vernon. Of course they're business friendly. Like, it's nothing but businesses. <laughs> it is nothing but businesses. The but fact, you know what? Does they, anybody live in Vernon? Very few people. Mr. But, Vernon. Mr. But a lot of people come in there to work. <laughs> a lot of people come in there to work. And what they've done is they've just made it very simple. All the departments talk to each other. Just the examples that Carol gave, they actually want businesses to locate there and be successful and create jobs. The second but thing... But is it really fair to compare a city of, like, Vernon to a city of, like, Los Angeles? I mean, the city of Vernon has 90 people. Los Angeles has 4 million, okay? City government has to be responsible for 4 million people, including homeless, including social services, police. Vernon has to be responsible for making sure the hot dog truck gets by for Farmer John's and all, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's not you know, a fair you, comparison. No, you bring up a very good point. But, but what's happened is that actually the city of LA has, has said, you know what, there are a lot of best practices that are out there that these <coughs> different cities, not only within LA County, but around the country are doing that we need to be doing. And, and that was one of the reasons that Carol and I got together. We were, I, I met with some people again at City Hall yesterday with developers and real estate brokers on, on how to get through these log jams to make it easier to do business mm -hmm. in the city of LA. The, the other thing I, I would recommend is that from an LA County Economic Development Corporation point of view, we're about jobs, creating, creating jobs that have high multiplier effects. So if you're, if you're in a manufacturing position, you typically have two and a half or three jobs that have to support that. So for our perspective, our goal is to create those kind of industrial jobs, whether it's high tech manufacturing, if it's information technology, entertainment, they're all located on industrial land. Our goal is to preserve industrial land so we can create these high quality, high paying jobs that all of you are going to want so that you can afford those terrific things like homes and cars and vacations and all those so great things. So were you things. against the adaptive reuse ordinance? No. No, I think that there is a place for everything. But, I, but, but we disagreed about the, industri the city's industrial use policy. And, and, the perp and the reason for that is that businesses need to have some place to grow. And those high quality, high paying jobs, we also need to have a place to live. There has to be a balance. But those high quality, high paying jobs, if, they're, if, if the property is, is rezoned to something else, you're going to lose it forever. And, and that's one of the discussions that we've had. If, if, you know, all entertainment, studios, uh, you know, which employ a lot of people, they all make a lot of money so they can you know, buy homes and things, that's all located on an industrial property. It isn't the big um, steel mills you know, with a lot of pollution in the air. So, so those would be my two recommendations. We have Steve Soboroff for 10 more minutes. So three questions, Steve, and then we're gonna let some Wait, students Let me give my... I know, well, what, first question number... Stay later. Question number one, what are your two <laughs> recommendations? 
Okay. Besides, yeah, the question number one, your two recommendations. Question number two, how did you... Don't confuse me. The, yeah. <laughs> this is where I lost mayor. People ask me two questions and I'd forget the second one. Yeah. So let me, let me answer the first one, okay? okay but you, but, this is my message wait a to the mayor of Los Angeles. People have called him the mayor of Playa Vista, at least. Call me a lot of stuff. Okay. okay. <laughs> Where's that camera guy? He's Aim this sucker right at my... Hey, hey, what's your name? Eddie? Will you aim that camera right here? Okay. <laughs> mayor? It's me, Steve. <laughs> How are you? How's the kids? Here are the two things, three things, that you can do that will give people a perception in business that the wind is behind them instead of in front of them. Number one, you must modify neighborhood councils to not allow them to deal with real estate issues. He can. It's in the charter. Yeah, he can. He can get a charter amendment. Okay. Turn off this guy's mic. Keep it on me, not him. <laughs> and number two. Okay. Because when neighborhood councils were created by Mayor Reardon, I, as his senior advisor, was sitting at the table, the intent of neighborhood councils was not about real estate entitlements because neighbors don't have planning expertise business expertise they have no expert i mean they have expertise but they their expertise is in the word no nimby nothing it's still my turn i know but now okay. we know why you lost for mayor but go ahead okay <laughs> yeah but now i'm going to fix that too but it's okay? but he's right and i'm going to fix i know right okay, number you. two okay number two politics here because of politics nobody votes Nobody votes. Even in this national election with Obama, everybody says, oh, so many people vote. Do you know more people voted percentage-wise in the election before Obama's election than this one? So you can imagine when there's not an Obama to vote next time, nobody's going to vote. But in L.A., nobody votes. Last time, 13% of the people voted. So you know what that means? A small number of people elect these council members. Who are they? The activists. What do the activists do? They say no about everything. Okay? So... Okay, so what specifically oh, is he supposed to do is change politics? Mr. Mayor, <laughs> I know he's your friend. He's a nice guy, but it's my turn. Okay, here's what we do. Politicians are, all want to get reelected. They're job. always running for office. And since nobody votes, what you got to do is pander to those that vote, and all they want you to do is say no. So the way you get elected in 12 of the 15 council districts in L.A. is to say no to everything. I get elected in two seconds. You just say, I don't want one more piece of traffic. I don't want one more building. I am sick of... You get elected easy. So what will give the politicians the back... the question, the backbone to where they can do what's right instead of what will get them reelected, right? Yeah? Okay. Give them six-year terms in office and give them two six-year terms so they can have this peace of mind that when they're in there, they don't have to start running for re-election right away. They can do what's right instead of what needs to be re-elected. And what happens is at the end of these four-year terms, the people are just hitting their strides, just get going, and a whole new flock comes in, and then they're lame ducks, and the system doesn't work. The council is... The, count, the people who elect people to city council, it takes 15,000 votes, 20,000 votes to be a council member in a city of millions and millions of people. These guys have to have more political peace of mind. Okay, number three. Um, I well, I said two, and you said you were going to give oh, three. I had a good one, too. Okay, well, let me ask you another question. If you think about that one, bring that back. I told you how, I how did... How, yeah, I know. Good thing I didn't ask I don't you. I do multitask. He's also a baby boomer. Yeah. <laughs> How did you bring... Uh, that was our best one. Uh, EA. How did yeah. you convince EA to move into Playa Vista? That's a good point. And then I want to say something nice about Carol, okay? <laughs> um, Electronic Arts is, uh, um, is... How many of you know of Electronic uh, Arts? You've got EA Games and all the razzmatazz, okay? My feeling was, can we bring something to Los Angeles 
that will bring a whole new industry here. This is the creative capital of the world. So we get these guys to come here instead of going to Redwood City or going this and that, consolidate down here that other people would follow. So they could have gone to Burbank. They could have gone to Glendale. They could have gone to El Segundo. El Segundo. All of these are cities around us. They could go to Vernon. We're all, OK. No, I don't think they what did Vernon. we have? What did we have? that they didn't. Besides being next to LMU. That was a big, big factor in their staying in Redwood City. But not. What we did is we offered them, perf we ha in those days, there were huge waiting lists to buy condos at Playa. Huge. I mean, hundreds of people for each unit. We didn't allow builders to jack prices to the market. We forced them to sell at certain price points so we could get diversity and we could have cops living there and everything else. If you were an EA, we told EA, if any employee you have that's working at EA, we will put to the top of the list on any unit. They couldn't get people to, they, LA was off the map because nobody could afford to live here then. That, that categorically changed your mind. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, finally, the, my third question. Are unions too powerful in Los Angeles yes. politics? Carol, it's not your turn. It's oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, um, when they're helping me, no. But when they're not helping me, yes. <laughs> um, they are. Yes, they're extremely powerful. Don't but be they, like a politician, Steve. Okay, but I can't help it. I mean, you know, unions owned a, a, a portion of Playa, and we sold a portion of Playa to labor unions, so they would help us politically because they're so politically strong. Um, you have a project labor agreement. Yes, we do, okay, but it doesn't. A project labor agreement. The unions say, "Well, you have to use union labor." But that's what a that's what a ten on a project labor agreement would say. Uh, a one would be you don't. You can do whatever you want to do. What ours is is a five. Remember the dimmer switch? Not all on, not all off. Ours says is we will give the last chance to a union contractor. But if his price is higher than the non-union, it goes to the non-union. Because if the, if the union price gets way up, then you're, you're forcing business out. But um, the union can be very, very helpful, um, very helpful politically, and uh, do great work. You just, you just, it's just not on or off. You have to moderate. So oh, I know. I've got to say something nice about Carol. Yes. <laughs> what Carol yeah, Schatz ahead. is doing to downtown is incredible. You know why? Our downtown's in the wrong place. Tell me a great downtown that isn't by water. Well, we used to be by the LA River, but then the, well, yeah, the river know. disappeared. Yeah, and uh, okay. So in order for, okay, when, when great downtowns are near water, you go there downtown to recreate, you go downtown to go to the beach, you go, come on, start thinking of them. Sydney, think of San Francisco. I mean, just think of them all over the, the world, the all river. over the world. Ours isn't, it's in the wrong location. So in order for somebody to go downtown, you've got to do five times the work than you would have to do if our downtown was by the, the Santa Monica Pier. So the uses, that's why I put Staples Center downtown. Because people, you needed something that people couldn't go see in their own neighborhood. That's right. You had to be premeditated. Right. So what she's done in downtown is way beyond what other people in other, other communities do in their downtowns because she's so disadvantaged, because her downtown's in the wrong location. So here we are at Loyola Marymount University, the Urban Lecture Series, Channel 36. Um, we have Steve for a couple more minutes, so I was going to see if we have some questions specifically for Steve. I have one of those Tesla electric cars, you know what those things are? Those cool How many of you have cars? heard of Tesla? It goes 250 miles on a charge, 0 to 60 in 3.9 seconds. Anyway, they're car. having this, yeah, it's a little sports car. It's really cool. <laughs> but they're having a whole group of Tesla owners get together for a chit chat and they're going to talk about the future of electric cars and I really want to go to that. So. Hey Fernando, I, I, I want to make a, a comment though on the lake because I think that's actually a well, pretty... I was going to go back and have yep. us talk about that but I just, I, I wanted the student, anybody have a question like how can I rent a place at Playa Vista, how can I get a job at Playa Vista, how can I uh, go... And First of all, I just encourage you to go because, it, because well, what our we, whole what slogan is, come, a, is uh, come, come visit. Uh, because you can't intellectualize Playa. You've got to go down there and get into it. You can't, get it. you can't get it by driving by on Lincoln or by Jefferson or by looking over your hill 
or do anything like that. Go down there and, and check it out. Well, why cool can't place. we build an escalator from an the escalator? LME sign down? I know most of our escalators don't work right now in University <laughs> Hall, but uh, some stairs or a funicular or, or bring the... Uh, um, we have plans to do an a, a energyless transportation system between LMU and down into Playa. So like from it's the called LMU, a, LMU a sign? What's it called? Vernicular? Furnicular? Yeah, whatever, vernicular. Whatever. Yeah. Vernicular. It's like angel flight. Yeah. Angel's okay. flight. Yeah. The problem is it travels over some native brush. Oh. And the native brush lovers of the world don't want it. There's a law called CEQA in California. Oh. And any of your, I can, CEQA, and I'm not even, -E -Q -A. Q -U, whatever it is. Yes. I don't even know how to spell it. It means somebody with 750 bucks the can California stop any project for five years. Well, that's what Act. It's, it's, it's not designed for urban America. It's designed for the outlying areas. It affects all kinds of urban environment. California Environmental Quality Act? Not, it's not designed for urban areas. And what it means is anybody with 700 bucks to file um, can stop anything that's right. for yes. 10 years, 15 Being years. It's impossible. Any, any questions? Right. Okay, yes, good. I was just wondering, can you just not incorporate some of the wild area parks where there's some uh, problems with the institutional stuff into parks where the park uh, provides natural brush, California brush, and a natural area for the animals to live, but also makes it a useful area for people to like okay. use, but you know, I mean, moderate use at what least. What you're talking about as, the, as a dimmer switch is a middle ground. There isn't a middle ground. People want in LA, in any park, they want one of two things. One is active recreation. Basketball, golf, tennis. Golf is not active. Well, oh, <laughs> whatever, okay. Or they want, want passive, yeah. or they want passive, which means open space, natural brush, but God, if you walk on natural brush, you break it. So they don't want, in other words, Passive space, and so they're running into huge issues, throwing little league fields out of areas that they want to have passive space. So you need, you need a middle ground. And yes, they can coexist. Come look at what we did. We have the greatest privately built public park system in America. Just go down there. Take your dog down there. We have a competitive gardening park So it's a, the, the well, park is open to anybody? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, any other questions for uh, Mr. Steve Soboroff, CEO of... Playa Vista, uh, mayor of Playa Vista. Yeah, come on up. Um, I was just wondering, there's a school, like, proposed sign down in Playa Vista. Yeah. And, like, what's the plan? Like, what grade level would it be for? And, like, how be, soon? Well, Playa Vista, I don't know if you guys know this, but it's a, it is a, um, did anybody watch Lost? <laughs> you know the way, like, weird things happen at Lost? Everybody that it's moves TV, to Playa Steve. Vista has a baby nine months and three days later. There are a thousand little kids at Playa Vista, so we have to build an elementary. A thousand. There's a, a, a strollers club, four o'clock every afternoon, 300 mothers and babies go walking around. Chaka, we have got to jam. build. That's, it's unbel it's <laughs> unbelievable. We have got to build. We have got to get a school. So we went to LAUSD. We got, it is approved. It's, well, we just reviewed the plans yesterday. It will be there before these kids get to kindergarten, so it's, um, 2012, and it will be a K-6. It's done in conjunction with LMU because you're going to do teacher training there and all kinds of things, environmental magnet school. And That's cool. It yeah, is so, I am so proud. I mean, you talk about things proud of. I mean, I didn't, we won that vote four to three. Four to three? On the school board. Why? Why was because there any opposition? <laughs> Tell me. Well, Give me a ring on my private line. I will. Yeah. No, I mean, the school board members want all the money in their own districts. So why, why come out here on the west side where the air is clear and you know, everybody, come on, those guys, you know, you want to see real problems, you know, look at what's going on. Look what's going on with the district now. They're going to fire teachers. So how do they pick which teachers to fire? Have you seen it? Yeah. By seniority? Right. Oh, so all these, any of you going to Teach for America when you get out of school? or anything like that, or city year, or whatever. All these Teach for America kids that are working in our school district, the new, bright, great, they all get fired fun. because the people that have been there forever are gonna, are gonna stay there, increasing the class the size by five. It's so scary. Any other are unions too strong in LA politics? Absolutely. Why? 
Um, in, a, in a democracy, they have the right to exercise their vote and... Everybody has a right to exercise their vote, but um, let, let me just, we, we just had an election on the County Board of Supervisors, and $8 million was spent by labor for one candidate. Yes, uh, he, and, he is referring to uh, Mark Willie Thomas, who we had here two weeks ago. And, uh, and Councilman Bernard Parks, both... Who we had here four weeks ago. Both we are... We didn't invite him at the same time. Both are wonderful individuals, bright, effective, I consider Mark to be a pro-business guy, but the, but the union spent $8 million to get him elected. And uh, if business had been able to raise that kind of money, I think there would have been a huge hue and cry uh, from the media and others, business is buying an election. But business I used think to it's buy important elections. Where? Not in L.A. Uh, yeah, no, what you, yes, historically, businesses... That was in, in 1950. Oh, I would say no, all the way up to the That's 50 years 50s. ago. But, 60 years but, ago. Okay, but so... Shows you my math, so here. Business is um, asleep at the switch. No, they're, they're no, ready? no, 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 no. Uh, business operates differently than labor. And... Uh, and I see now that I've been representing them for you know, almost 20 years what the difference is. You're a union member, you pay dues. Uh, the dues are used by your leadership to support candidates that support the issues that are important to you know, organized labor uh, or not. If you are trying to, let's say you want to develop a piece of property. You cannot develop that piece of property in the city of L.A. or in any other city unless you have the support of the elected official in that district and probably the mayor. So what is the safest thing for you to do? If you're in a contested race, you're going to give to both candidates, right? Mm -hmm. You give to both candidates and because you need to be able to do business with whomever you, uh, you know, whoever gets elected. Unions won't do that. They're not going to give to both sides. They're going to pick the candidate that they think is going to best represent their interests. And they, and, and they, so they put their money on one horse. And because business continues to sort of dilute its effectiveness by giving to both sides, it doesn't have the clout that organized labor has, um, and, and elected officials know that it doesn't make any difference if they tick off the business community because they're going to get their money anyway. So that, you know, that's part, so, and, and you so can... What's the solution to this? Well. The solution is, well, I actually would have to think about, about what specifically you could do. What my only, you know, what I think works best is to have a, have a political climate where there is a balance between business and labor, between uh, activists and others, where you, ha where you have a balance, and we're losing that balance in this, Los Angeles. It's business false, though. Business uh, has allowed this to happen. Business I, used to dominate. Business, there was no balance. Business greatly dominated uh, LA that's politics. That's true. Okay? That's true. But, and after a while, I think they got lazy. They got disengaged. Um, I think the no, chamber was... No, corporate uh, headquarters moved out of Los Angeles. And they don't... And, and Los Angeles, right now, Los Angeles has no corporate headquarters. Think about it. The LA Times is owned by a Chicago company. All right? The largest private employer in the city of Los Angeles is the University of Southern California. Uh, in downtown, we have, uh, we have Bank of America. Where is it headquartered? Charlotte, North Carolina. We have Wells Fargo. Where is it headquartered? I don't even, San Francisco, I think. No, Correct. no, no, no. Or is, it, yes. or is it, huh? It is San, San Francisco. Francisco. How about Northrop Grumman? That's headquartered in... Uh, it, but, it's, but it's in El Segundo. No, Northrop Grumman is in Century City. And then most of the studios are outside the city of L.A., with the exception of Fox and Paramount. So 
so, and part of the reason why business moved out is for the reasons we were just talking about before, is that the cities did, did not encourage business and they imposed business license taxes on business that were higher here than they were in other places. So when a business is trying to figure out whether to headquarter in LA, they have to factor in that business license tax. If they can access the same employee base, why not just headquarter yourself just outside the city limit and get the, and get the benefits of a lower business license tax and still have access to our, you know, to, to Los Angeles and what, and, and what it offers. So, um, Javier, you actually get some of your money from union pension funds. Mm -hmm. From public pension funds. Public yes. pension funds. Mm -hmm. But that's actually what, the comment I wanted to make. And again, I, I hate to bring it up because, you know, I am an Angelino. I do live in Eagle Rock. I love living here. <laughs> but when I go and visit New York, it always shows me what we could do here. And one of the things is what Carol hit, you know, I think just said it, it exactly how it should be, which is we need a balance. I mean, if you go to New York, they have an even bigger, you know, problem with housing than LA. I mean, a significant problem. But you see business and labor working together to address that problem because ultimately, who's that housing for? It's for the labor force. It's not for the business. It, I mean, you hate to say now the dirty word of Wall Street, right? They all live in Greenwich, Connecticut. But they all know that all the businesses that they own, all the portfolio companies that they invest in, that's run by the labor force. And it is part of their business model to ensure that there is a labor force. I think there's such a disconnect here where you literally have an us versus them between business and labor. And that's just got to stop. When you talk about, and you alluded to this, the reason we got public pension fund money in large part was because you had firemen and teachers and you know government workers who were commuting two hours and still are. I mean, the, the, the dirty little secret about this downturn is that it's only a false you know, lull in the affordability issue for housing in the, in the greater LA area. Yes, housing is cheaper now, but financing is harder to get, right? right? So you've actually lost the benefit of allowing folks to get into homes and be part of their communities by owning, which everyone knows is always you know a, a very good thing to try to aspire to and so when the market comes back you're gonna have the same problem and then when you add to that again because anybody who thinks that four dollar gas isn't coming back that's trust me it is going to happen and it's gonna happen sooner than we think Don't buy a SUV. yeah and so the point being is pension funds gave us money in large part because they understood that they needed to be part of the solution they understood that they needed to you know partner with the private sector and come up with new housing opportunities for their own labor force. And again, when you ask me, you know, what could, what's a, what's a specific thing that can happen? The mayor does have a bully pulpit to say enough is enough. We're all in this together. And, and you know, specifically, I, I actually may, may differ, uh, for, and, and it's probably with Steve if he was here as well, we need to think of LA as an LA region. When we go in the capital markets and we say LA, no one's telling me, oh, give money to the city of L.A. versus El Segundo or what have you. They're saying greater L.A., you know, and we need to think of it that way. This is the greater L.A. area. It's the greater metro area, and we need to look at solutions that way. And so what could the mayor do? It could, he could specifically break down this us versus them between labor and business and also think of it in broader terms. So when you talk about infrastructure, when you talk about... Uh, mass transit, it's for the greater LA area to move goods and peoples around all of LA. Those are specifics. So I have promised this panel that we would end at, at 6.30. I'm five minutes over, but I think we'll have time for one or two questions if a uh, student has a question. So, yeah, you know, Alex, any, anybody else want you to just line up behind uh, and we'll take these two questions and, yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about what incentives bring businesses to LA. Uh, and I had a question specific to wages. Uh, we've had conversation uh, here at LMU about the living wage, uh, specifically with Hilton on Century Boulevard. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, um, when you have wages uh, artificially raised, when you have these price floors set in wages, uh, does that have an adverse effect on the greater economy by 
uh, curbing incentives for businesses looking to come to LA? And uh, secondly, also, does it, it, will it lead to businesses leaving? Well, the, it's more expensive to do business here in LA. Uh, Any time that you're going to have the no, Carrie, explain increase. just for the students a little bit about the living wage, what, what, what that is. Well, it, it is, it is a, a level of a salary so that you can be able to buy your basic goods. So, so it's above the minimum wage. It is. And, and, and what happens with, with businesses when they're looking to locate in places, they're looking at, as we've all mentioned here before, in doing a place that is the most efficient for them, the most effective, the most cost beneficial and still in that target area that they're looking for with all of um, perhaps you know, all the people that are going to be going to their their business their place of business whether it's retail or industrial and it, when you have a living wage it raises the cost of everything so businesses will now say it costs X number of dollars it's really kind of a bottom line thing it's going to cost X number of dollars over here or it's going to cost X number of dollars over here because we don't have to do living wages and so there is it is a cost issue Carol, did you want to comment I agree. on that? I mean, that, that just sort of says it at all. Nobody in business, none of my members say, oh, let's, let's screw the workers. You know, let's give them the least amount we can. It's a question of cost. And it also adds to the final bill that you pay for your you know, uh, for your, your, your rent, or your, if you buy a, a, an apartment, or what you pay for your hamburger, or anything else. And uh, it would be great if we lived in a, in a if, we ha if we had a situation where everybody could make, you know, $80,000 a year. But we are now in a global economy where, you know, if we, <laughs> If we are manufacturing and paying people a certain amount, then businesses are very likely, because of the cost of you know, creating a very high wage structure, to move that business to a country where the, the wages are lower. So it's, 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 it's a, again a balance that has to be struck, because you want people to live in, in a way where they can support their families and so forth. But you have to do it in a way where you don't kill the business uh, and, and mandate all of this. And there's certain wages, there's certain, as I said, there's certain industries where uh, that don't pay a living wage. Retail is one of the examples. And, you know, again... But you know what? Retail, you can't take abroad. I mean, someone's got to be no. here to sell. And I was just going to say, you can't. Uh, but... The, the question is, is everybody in this audience willing to pay more for that sweater, for that hamburger? Because that's what happens. You know, so you, as the ultimate consumer, pay that price. Yeah. Somebody pays for it. Tracy? Uh, it was acknowledged earlier that unions are uh, very powerful right now in L.A. And if there is a power struggle between business and unions, why doesn't business adopt the strategy that unions are using? Instead of funding both candidates, why not like, to take, to do what it takes like unions are doing and elect a candidate? Put all the money on one person's shoulders and get him into office as opposed to playing both sides of the game. Yeah, Javier? I mean, abs you know, obviously if Carol was here, she'd have a lot more to say about that. But no, I think that's a very, um, from the business perspective, that's clearly being considered. It's clearly being discussed a little bit more about what is our political strategy as a whole. But again, I, just given what we do, our, and I'm just speaking for our firm, we see this as needing to be more collaborative. It, it, it has to stop at some point. I mean, the fundamental nature of what we are focused on really needs both public and private, you know, um, cooperation. And in fact, you know, I just came back from D.C. One of the things I was there for was for the announcement of the public-private investment funds. I mean, that's a basic example on a federal level of saying, you know what, the public entities are not going to be able to pull us out of this recession by themselves. So when you talk about political strategies, when you talk about economic strategies, at some point you're going to have to realize there are synergies where people's needs both have to be accommodated. And at some point, I really do see the political climate in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles having to address that issue. So, Thank you. And one last question. Um, I understand you guys are talking about a balance between business and um, uh, government. 
um, public interest, but if the government does such a poor job at providing the regulation or the other side of the balance, who will provide the incentives, who will regulate businesses so that it's quality and it's not just quantity? How can we make sure that these are businesses that we want, that they're green businesses, that are green homes, and not just businesses and homes, but yeah, quality I mean, ones? To just to follow up on that, business has very little standing right now. The lack of regulation, when, when left to their own devices, look what they created. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's tough for us to say, hey, less regulation, less government intervention. I mean, I think on a national level, you're exactly right. If you're looking at federal policy, I actually believe that we have done an incredibly terrible job of deregulating, you know, in particular my industry, which is the financial, you know, services industry. It's just been, uh, it's, it has been terrible. We all knew it. I mean, if you look at hedge funds across this country, you know, they, you know, to answer your question from a little bit earlier, they actually did bound together and did quite a bit of, of con political contribution so that they couldn't be regulated by the SEC. I do agree there has to be a balance. And what you're seeing in Los Angeles right now, though, at the local level is a balance the other way, where it's over-regulated. And so, you know, I'm always a big fan of the power of one, is what I always say, which is, for example, in housing, zero affordable housing units is always less than one. So if you can create something where you're creating even just one new unit, you know, working together between business and labor and business and government or what have you to start creating one that's always better than zero. And then you can move on to two, ten, a hundred. And so I think that's probably the comment too that okay. you were hearing today. One more last question. Okay. Um, I just wanted to I remember when you mentioned the balance of, of public of infrastructure that supports business in New York compared huh? to LA. I wanted to mention how in New York there are a number of think tanks that are actually devoted specifically to to promoting this balance. Do you believe that the absence of think tanks similar in wait, wait, LA wait, wait, wait. the Center for the Study of oh. the Center. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. All right. Excise. Except Excise. for. Except, yes, with, with the exception of the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. All right, next um, <laughs> do you think Do you think that the absent actually cripples Los Angeles, or do you think that emergence of similar think tanks would, would, do, would fix the problem? I, I absolutely think it will, but I, I do take exception. I don't see Los Angeles having less civic participation from think tanks or I actually think it's there I think what's happened is you take a place like New York and you have a think tank they can get on the New York Times and it becomes they're the they're the experts speaking for XYZ uh, constituency group I do believe there are a lot of entities in Los Angeles that do have a lot of influence they just may not have the same profile as what you see out in New York but you're right I mean I do think that it's not just business it's not just government it's not just labor it's also acad the academic world it's also the nonprofit world I my sister actually runs the East Harlem AIDS clinic which is a public-private venture between Mount Sinai, the city of New York, and then a conglomerate of nonprofit groups in East Harlem. And the reality is they all come together to actually make something happen. It, it does take more than just one or the other type of uh, Well, group. let's go, go ahead, Carrie. You know, and I would agree. I, I think it's a collaborative effect. And, and what we have here in Los Angeles is a little bit more fragmented. Um, we have the best universities in the world that are in Los Angeles County. Thank you. you know, we, we, get, we get more funding for research in L.A. County than any other county in the entire United States. However, there's a fragmentation, and that's what he's talking about. We are not working collaboratively together. We're not building, you know, um, or, or anytime we have research, what we see is incubators. Businesses don't stay here. They go, they go someplace else. They won't keep their businesses here to be able to grow them and employ all of you bright people so that you can you know make tons of money and come up with some great new products they go elsewhere you know we need to collaborate and try to figure out how do we keep those think tanks here how do we create these incubators keep these businesses here to employ all of you your, your bright futures and your and great ideas and, and and really follow some of the best practices that we see in these other large urban areas so let's give a Loyola Marymount University thank you to our panelists <laughs>